Okay, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this afternoon session on rethinking hygiene behavior change, pandemic and beyond. Um, we're just going to wait for a couple of minutes uh, for um, the attendees to join us and then we'll get going. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the session on rethinking hygiene behavior change, pandemic, and uh, beyond. We'll get started as we wait for more attendees uh, to join us. We have a great afternoon session uh, that is planned uh, for today. Um, we are going to be discussing a, a topic that has, in, has gained in interest uh, as well as in relevance uh, over the past two to three months, and that is of, um, of hygiene, uh, especially hand washing. Um, hand washing has attained a prominence that it has not been able to do over the past 30 to 40 years uh, due to the COVID pandemic. But it has also brought us to think about how we need to relook really at hygiene behaviors, uh, hand washing, as well as other related hygiene behaviors. And that's the purpose of our session today. We have brought together a number of experts from organizations that are working um, on water sanitation hygiene, uh, on health, on behavior change, on communication, uh, to discuss and to deliberate on um, a few critical points that the COVID pandemic has uh, brought, uh, brought to light uh, with regards to hygiene behavior change. Um, just a few, um, just to introduce you to our, uh, our fantastic panel, we have Shalini Prasad, who is a C4D specialist from UNICEF, the India office. Uh, Lara Gulia, who's the senior executive programs, is joining us from the Tata Trust. We have Radharani Mitra, who's a global creative advisor uh, from BBC Media Action. And we have Om Prasad Gautam, who's a senior wash manager for hygiene um, from WaterAid in the UK. Um, I'm Arundhati Murlitra, and I work with WaterAid India uh, in the policy team. Um, a few housekeeping rules before we uh, we get started with our uh, session. Um, please, uh, for all the attendees, please type in your questions in the Q and A chat box. That's the chat box to the left of the regular chat box. This will enable all speakers as well as the organizers to keep track uh, of the questions that you posed to us uh, on the panel and we'll be sure to get to them. In fact, we're going to, we're trying to schedule the last 15 minutes at the very least, if not 20, to take the questions that arise from the audience. Um, if you cannot hear any speaker, please let us know at the chat box. We have the Chacha organizers as well as the water aid team who are keeping a close eye on it. If you're having any technical difficulties, do let us know. Um, please be assured that we do respect your questions and we will get to your questions at the end of the session or towards the end of the session. Um, some of us, uh, um, on the panel do have internet bandwidth issues. So some speakers will be turning their videos on and off as we speak. So do bear um, with us. Um, when we are responding to a particular question, we'll make sure that we have our video on. And when we are not responding to a question, we'll turn our videos um, off. So with that, um, I'm going to proceed. We have a few questions that we are going to uh, deliberate on today. And I'm just going to put them up for you to see. Um, so um, we've realized that it's important for us to kind of rethink how we're approaching hygiene behavior change. Um, and a few things that I think organizations across the board have been grappling with are uh, to do with whether we need to expand the content of hygiene messages. And by this, we mean that a lot of focus has been put on hand hygiene, but the COVID pandemic has also brought to light other issues related to hygiene, such as physical distancing, respiratory hygiene. So we're going to ask our panelists to kind of rethink about expanding the content of hygiene messages. What should we include? What should we include comprehensively so it doesn't overwhelm our audiences or our target group? And also, where do we begin to deliver these messages? For example, traditional wash programming often looks at um, hand hygiene promotion in the context of schools. 
but now we realize that we need to expand the uh, our um, our target groups to include schools other institutions communities reach urban and rural audiences um you know and across also wealth quintiles so we're going to ask our speakers to deliberate on this the second issue is on looking at alternative mediums and channels by which we can communicate with our communities and by this we mean that we're often used to face to face interpersonal communication but this pandemic over the past two months has made us rely on other channels of communication we want to hear what are those effective channels of communication um a third critical question which is not necessarily related to the pandemic but on um on hygiene and behavior change programming in general is on measurement how do we measure reach how do we measure change in knowledge in attitude in behavior um in access uh, to um to hygiene infrastructure and how do we measure impact uh, at this particular time and beyond and lastly we want all our speakers to deliberate on a really important question is um is that of um the recommendations that we we have to governments both at the national at the state level as well as internationally as well as to uh, the donor community institutional donors corporate donors to support hygiene behavior change programming uh, during uh, this time and uh, in the in the foreseeable future so with that um i'm going to um open the floor with two our panelists uh, and welcome to our panelists um i'm going to um uh some we're going to direct questions to all our panelists but certain questions will be directed to some of them so our first question is on um expanding the content uh of hygiene messaging so in light of the covid pandemic should we be looking at expanding the scope of hygiene messaging which are the populations that we should reach should be is it time that we move beyond school based hygiene promotion um to looking at other ways by which to um reach our intended audiences so should we look at other types of educational institutions health institutions work sites as well as communities um so i'm going to ask shalini um from unicef india and om from water aid india to uh, to respond to this but i'll ask shalini uh, to take to share her thoughts with us first okay uh, good afternoon uh, everyone and thank you arundhati uh, very much for uh, inviting me to uh, this panel uh, indeed a, a very uh, interesting topic uh, on hygiene promotion and especially when you talk about hand washing with soap i think though promoted by multiple sectors including wash hand washing with soap has always been a secondary behavior if you uh, look at uh, health programs uh, promoting hand washing with soap it has always been you know after diarrhea management first they will be uh, talking more about the curative thing and then about the preventive thing if we are talking about swachh bharat mission it was always more about toilet construction and toilet use and hand washing uh, with soap became a secondary behavior though critically important it was always it always had a second space so uh i think one of the good uh things that has happened in in the hygiene promotion campaigns that have been uh, uh you know undertaken by multiple ministries now is the focus on hand washing with soap because we know that it is the most effective preventive behavior moving from uh, that i think uh, in the covid era how we are uh, defining hygiene behaviors are more like covid specific behaviors and covid sensitive behaviors and i would like to look at it with a wash lens so of course hand washing with soap is the specific preventive behavior that really needs to be um uh, promoted and adopted by people but also if we see the <coughs> respiratory etiquette behaviors i think uh, spitting needs to be added to that and um, if you see the advisory which i have shared uh, with you the department of drinking water and sanitation will uh, actually go about uh, bringing it in a big way in their hygiene promotion campaign so uh, adding on to uh, you know respiratory etiquette uh, that we need to promote we also need to promote uh, that spitting in open spaces is not uh, uh, right and it is it is a major uh, factor for uh, you know increasing the infections of not just uh, covid but also of many other uh, diseases 
with the wash lens that we see social distancing uh, is also extremely important uh, now with the uh, if we see swachh bharat mission uh, phase 2 and uh, the key objective of leaving no one behind uh, the construction process the retrofitting process the operation and maintenance of uh, infrastructure is uh, going to be key so that it is absolutely necessary that we bring in uh, the message of social uh, distancing not only for the community but also for uh, the workers who are there on the construction site be it the mason or, or the person who's directing the construction so all these things i think are the key uh, covid uh, specific behaviors uh, that need to be included along with hand washing with soap there are many uh, wash sensitive behaviors also we talk about odf sustainability and it cannot be done unless the toilet use is sustained so for that we need to consistently uh, promote uh, toilet use by everyone all the time along with that along with high hand hygiene i would also say that safe uh, storage and handling of drinking water is uh, equally important along with that all the solid and liquid waste management i think uh, with more uh, households uh, uh, using uh, masks and gloves and other hazardous materials which can be used at the household level if people are in quarantine or in self isolation uh, these needs to be managed uh, very effectively and um, uh, we really need to have very uh, correct and specific uh, messaging for that um, absolutely uh, critical and and my last point would be on menstrual hygiene uh, management which needs to be continued uh, maybe in lockdown situations and 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 uh, some of uh, the access uh, may be difficult and challenging uh, during uh, this time so uh, this is one of the areas uh, which really uh, needs to be strengthened and uh, continued with um, uh, during the, the lockdown and post uh, lockdown period also and ensure uh, that uh, access uh, of hygiene products is available um, uh, women and girls are aware of what are the right practices um, and one one last thing because uh, we are talking about women and girls uh, the gender sensitive messaging especially for maintenance uh, of toilets and uh, uh, and um, uh, you know fetching water and these areas we really need to do gender sensitive uh, messaging there i'll stop here and uh, thank you shalini um, you've given us a great list of hygiene messages um, to think through um, Om, um, turning to you, um, you've been uh, in your role kind of looking at guiding water aid uh, across the countries where we work on looking at what are the types of hygiene messages that we should be promoting through our work. Um, and you've also um, been in touch with various, I think, uh, academic institutions, researchers, practitioners uh, at the global end who are thinking about this. So can you shed some light on what's the, what's the thinking um, uh, beyond India. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Arundhati, and thank you for North Foundation and other collaborators for organizing this, uh, this uh, conference in a, in a very uh, right timing. Um, well done, everyone. Um, this is a good question, Arundhati. I think um, um, when it comes to targeting specific behaviors, we should always look, um, we always need to understand the transmission pathways for this virus uh, in order to scope which behavior we should be targeting, what messaging we should be focusing on. Since this virus transmit uh, from infected person to others who are in close contract uh, through the res respiratory drop droplets or through direct contract with the infected person or by contaminated hands or objects or surface, these transmission pathways should be looked by practicing multiple behaviors. So these pathways, the pathways can actually be worked by practicing the multiple behaviors. Pathways may not be enough, and uh, therefore we need to target multiple behaviors. I think the what evidence telling us globally, of course, we are very early stage of these viruses being 
around five to six months um, uh, since it started we are preliminary early stage um, uh, to, to conclude everything. But what evidence tell us so far, we should be definitely targeting multiple EADS. Uh, and we should, it is important for us to focus on behavior change rather than just telling people this and that. At, at, at least we know in this particular group that just focusing on the messaging, telling people do this and that is not going to work. At the same time, we also need to understand targeting too many behaviors might lose their attention, but while also targeting too less will not enough to address all the transmission pathways. So therefore, globally, you look at the evidence, if you look at the, the global practices, the WHO, and then the CDC, the UK government, and others, and including Watered and other partners, we're actually trying to realign some of the key behaviors that are prominent within these transmission pathways. As previous speaker mentioned, hand washing is with soap um, at critical moments has seen as a first line of defense. Of course, there are critical moments before eating, after touching um, uh, uh, frequently touch surfaces, before feeding to the baby, after, before touching nose and mouth. Those are critical points we should be focusing on. Of course, we're focusing on in the last few years. Um, in, in but this is the time we have seen the importance of hand washing at a greater scale for the first time, and this is important. Similarly, um, of course, the respiratory hygiene, as previously mentioned, is also quite key because the droplets infection and you know the the, the covering and uh, covering nose and mouth when someone uh, cough and sneeze is quite a, quite equally important. That links to with the the, the hand washing with soap followed it by coughing and sneezing. At the same time, the physical social distancing is is quite um, uh, vital. Of course, we call it uh, social distancing and in general term. I would say is this is this should be physical distancing in this difficult time. We really want to be socially connected virtual, even like this. This is a connection, but uh, we really need to maintain the physical distancing because of the nature of the virus, um, which means close, avoiding close contact, at least maintaining yes, the two meter distance in many countries that mentioned, but WHO mentioned one meter, so whatever the country um, decides, that um, distance has to be maintained. But the problem in many countries, what, what we have seen, maintaining physical distancing might be viable in, in, um, uh, in uh, high income settings. But what, what about in low income settings, particularly in highly densely populated area, if we are living, living in a slum area, um, if you need to access water from the, from the communal water points or you go for hand washing facilities, you know, even outside of your house, how are you going to maintain this physical distancing? Lots of innovation coming from different countries where we are, um, even in India, we have seen lots of um, the amazing innovation coming in, but yeah, that's the critical behaviors. The, the other behaviors, that's because of the nature of the virus, the cleanliness of the surface, because people may walk out from the house and then when they came in they frequently touch the door handles they touch their mobiles when people go outside or even people when they eat they even eat touch the mobiles uh, maybe there are specific locations within the households people touch it if you are working in a workplace you go in a, on a in an office the first thing you do is if you touch the door handles are those surfaces are frequently clean or not matters a lot i think that those are key points and the final behavior is self-isolation. Those are COVID specific behaviors, the four critical behaviors linked with COVID based on the nature. But at the same time, what we don't, we don't need to forget is um, of course, we are in a COVID uh, pandemic era, but at the same time, the other opportunistic infections, the other diseases like cholera, the diarrhea, those are still there. We should not forget this, right? So when you package it, all of these, we should package it in a comprehensive manner, but at the same time, we should be also mindful that other disease might, might still be happening. So though we linked with COVID these four behaviors, but at the same time, the water treatment, the, the, the food hygiene aspects has to be equally prioritized where possible. But when it comes to linked with the COVID-19, we should give the right killer message because for instance, so far there is no evidence or there are not adequate evidence or not either enough evidence for us to think the, the, the virus can be transmitted through feces or virus can be transmitted through contaminated water, this particular virus. But at the same time, we know that might cause for the cholera or diarrhea, right? So kind of featuring those is, is quite um, vital as well. Um, but let's not pack all of this behavior in, um, uh, in a similar, similar way. The two things I would like to highlight here, the messaging has to be crafted according to the behaviors. What people should be doing precisely it can be direct message for the awareness rising, or it can be, should be explaining why people should be doing it. 
and how this specific behavior, why this is specific behavior is important for people to practice has to be pizza. It's not about tell people or this, this and that. So we should be really explaining why and how, but all of these are cognition focus. Telling people to do this and that is not going to work. We should be aiming to make this messaging more emotional to the people, more appealing to the people so that it sticks in people's head. So at the same time, we should be thinking, what are those nudges and reminders we can put in place in different locations where the behavior happens so that people can actually remain uh, those behavior. That is quite vital. I'll also like to emphasize here, there are different audiences that we will be, should be talking with. So the public as a whole, of course, but there are specific risk group for this virus. Of course, the elderly, the, the people with the, some of the underlying causes, um, the, uh, the, uh, are more susceptible for this. But when you craft the messaging, how do we reach with those people more precisely is quite different. Let's take an example of hand washing. The public uh, for messaging for public for hand washing might be a little different if you are targeting to the doctors and nurses or to the school students in any school location. The, the critical points are quite different. So we should be very much mindful where um, we target and how we target. At the same time, we really need to think uh, how we address the, the need of different peoples. If we, let's say, of course, we'll talk about the delivery channel subsequently, but what I would like to emphasize here, your messaging might vary depending on from where you deliver and who is your target audience. So we need to be very much mindful and through which we'll be channeling to those uh, uh, people. And let's conclude saying that messaging only is not enough. So we really need to think emotions into the message. I really would like to emphasize here the, the way people trigger their behavior now is due to fear. People are rushing to buy the products and fear is a temporary stimulus. It is not going to stick in people's mind forever. So therefore, when you message it, let's bring love, affections, wash your hands for the benefit of your future, for the benefit, bright future of your family. It protects yourself, your family, your loved one. So we need to bring these emotions into it. And we really need to create a social desire um, for the people to practice this behavior rather than telling do this and that it should come as part of the social norms and of course all of these will help to expand the scope of the um, of the um, hygiene messaging that you you pull on uh, our, the people thank you so much om you've made um, some fantastic points looking at covid critical behaviors um, you have also i think made a really important point in evidence backed COVID hygiene messaging and how other hygiene messages can also be included, but to make sure that, um, that we're being clear that these are not related to COVID so that we're not confusing our audience. Um, you made an important point on looking on, on going beyond messaging and looking at some of those emotive factors uh, that can help us sustain these important behaviors um, in the long run. So thank you um, for those. Um, Radharani, I know you had some points on this and I'll ask you to actually um, incorporate your points as I'm and I, as I ask you uh, to respond to um, question two. And our second question, our point of discussion, uh, is to look at how we need to step out of our the regular ways by which um, we communicate with our audiences. So, what are some of these? Um, what are some of the novel ways, some of the innovative ways, or some, perhaps some of the regular channels by which we can communicate with our audiences that doesn't necessarily involve face-to-face -face communication? Um, so, Ratharani, I request you to um, start the discussion on this, and then uh, we'll hear from Lara. Right. Thanks, Arunuti. Thanks very much uh, for having me on the panel. Um, you've given me a very, very interesting and challenging um, point to discuss. I'll begin with things that people uh, ordinarily do. So, you know, looking at channels like mass media, looking at channels like uh, activation, outreach, interpersonal communication, and of course, digital. Now, I'll just quickly go through each one of these. Um, in terms of mass media, uh, people are still watching a lot of television. Uh, people, we know that radio listenership has gone up. If we go in country, if we go into more rural areas, we know community radio stations play a very significant role. So definitely if there, is, if there are resources to create both COVID specific and COVID sensitive uh, communication packages for mass media channels, then 
that's a that's still a very very um, workable solution. However, we must remember that mass media requires a lot of investment in terms of buying airtime. So there has to be funds either with implementers or with the people who are creating content or donor funding, but most importantly, government funding and arrangements so that uh, outputs can be um, put on air, can be broadcast. Um, there are a couple of very interesting um, information uh, points that are coming in. For example, uh, as I said, radio listenership has gone up, but equally we know that OTT viewership has gone up by leaps and bounds. There is nearly a 70% increase uh, in people accessing OTT content, um, you know, through connected devices. But what is more important is that there is a very obvious shift from individual viewing to group behavior to a group behavior so viewership there is morphing into sitting and watching something on your phone or on your laptop uh, from people actually sitting around and watching something but that would also bring me to the question of the digital divide divide now we we know that digital channels depends primarily on smartphone ownership and access to data we can still uh, reach hard to reach audiences and communities uh, who have basic phones or brick phones still. And there is a very large swath of India that does not have access to smartphones yet. Uh, and for those people, for those communities, IVR is still a very, very workable solution. At BBC Media Action, we have used IVR extensively, but uh, because smartphone ownership is still limited in rural areas particularly there is you know digital can be very divisive there is an urban and rural divide there's a gender divide there's a socio-economic divide and with livelihoods in at peril growing imbalance in economy there may be issues in how much people want to spend on data so there are very very big challenges in providing content and communication through uh, smartphones uh, and we really need to, as not just the development sector, but uh, across the board, people need to ponder on these questions quite, uh, you know, quite, quite intensively. Uh, we're also hearing from brand marketeers uh, looking at, uh, you know, alternate ways of reaching uh, communities. Uh, and uh, there are lots of brands that have already partnered or tied up with NGOs or civil society organizations working on ground to take them at messages along with all the other work that they're doing. So these are some of the some of the things that people have started doing already. Looking at what can be done through uh, using social media or WhatsApp. Now, uh, uh, as we know, IVR and WhatsApp are, can be done on feature phones, but WhatsApp is yet to roll out uh, its feature of ads or you know a business um, a business account. Now, in the absence of this, uh, the the uh, you can we can only look at organic reach, right? Um, there is another thing that was done quite effectively with WhatsApp, and I myself was part of that effort. This was the other pandemic that happened um, in the world a few years ago, the Ebola pandemic in West Africa, where the larger BBC and BBC Media Action in its response to the Ebola epidemic uh, used WhatsApp quite effectively within uh, even using radio content. So when we created uh, you know, radio content for Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, we took stuff out from that content and we used them on WhatsApp. So there is a lesson there in working smart and using modular outputs that can be you know, used across different platforms. Um, now, creating chatbots for user interactivity and chatbots can be done for IVR as well. That requires time, resources for development. Uh, one has to test and market the chatbot. So chatbot could be a unique tool, but then we have to ask ourselves the question that if there is already a dedicated chatbot on COVID-19 by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in India and by the World Bank, is there a need for one more? Um, there is another point that I'd like to make on, on the question of platforms, um, that a lot of existing platforms, and Arunduti, you alluded to it, uh, like schools, both in urban and rural India, 
like Anganwadi centers, like, uh, you know, um, self-help groups, or like the VHSND platform, a lot of these uh, platforms are becoming what I call ghost platforms, because there isn't anything happening on those platforms for obvious reasons. So can we either change the way these platforms are operating and can we look at building new platforms? Um, there, is, uh, there is the other thing that I wanted to touch upon is that we know that, you know, in urban India, in all the cities, our, our children are all doing distance schooling, you know, using Zoom. What happens to people, what happens to students who don't have access to digital, right? How are they... Uh, you know, going to school, how are they learning? Because, uh, because you know, uh, younger children, because children, uh, 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 adolescents and young adults um, are very, very key uh, audiences for wash behaviors, the, even the expanded wash behaviors. So how can we innovate? And is there a way of, you know, therefore doing IVR lessons? We ourselves are looking at creating something along the lines of what has already been created by us for the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare on family health as well as for sanitation workers, swachagrahis. And we're looking at creating a suite of IVR content uh, for, you know, uh, members and leaders of self-help groups. Uh, and uh, this actually is would be music to some of your ears because we are not looking at COVID response as just very specific, but we're looking at a larger suite of messages, which is to build up overall resilience of communities. So I hope that comes through. The other thing that I really want to stress upon is the building up of community radio networks. We know that community radio networks have grown exponentially uh, in India, but I don't think as a network we are still um, you know, investing enough. Uh, there are two, three things that we have done, and I can speak for experience, uh, both in India and globally, in my global work, what we have done, there are three things that can be done. One is that you go in, you create outputs and you give it to the community radio networks and they can play those outputs. And of course you do it in an audience sensitive, localized manner, right? So that's one. But in giving them output, we can also start mentoring and building their capacity where for a while we do handholding with them, training and you know mentoring we do hand-holding with them, we set them on their path, move away and dip in from time to time to see how they're doing. But all of that needs investment, it needs resources, but I think there is a, there is a khazana, there is a gold mine of talent, resources, people that are held in those community radio networks, which at a time like this could be used to great advantage um, in spreading the right messages, not just behavioral messages, but working on attitudes on, you know, wash behaviors, increasing knowledge, and of course, you know, changing practice. Uh, so there is, there is this whole thing. So in terms of making a broader point, Arundhati uh, and my co-panelists and people who are listening in, making a broad point about innovation and what else can we do, uh, we really need to, if you're looking at behavior change in different ways, not just creating communication, we really need to create an enabling environment, both in terms of investing in new platforms, you know, using, reusing old platforms, morphing old platforms into new patterns of consumption. And we, we have to look at also infrastructure. So for example, if if we can if we can do a piece of communication at a water source you know how do we do that is there an enabling environment to get that going so we have to look at we have to look beyond creating communication into creating platforms uh, so for example we know that Google Sathi um, has been working with the government of India in increasing digital literacy at the block level. And I think that there is a, there is a, there is a very, very uh, big need for, um, you know, for India to look at ways and means in which we can uh, increase digital uh, literacy and digital access, digital usage, and uh, the development of, you know, uh, the development of 
apps and all will still be pilots or you know limited to small areas or geographical areas but we need to come up with solutions that can be scaled up quite quickly because the need because of the need of the hour but also because you know this is a this is a this is a watershed moment in humanity and we need to look at using this moment in coming up creating you know different ideas so i referred to uh, you know what's happening to people who who cannot perhaps you know have zoom calls we know of this wonderful new app called top parent that has been launched in madhya pradesh uh, it's been done um, by the center square foundation and we in fact uh, the hand washing output that we have created we have just gotten into a partnership with top parent and our hand washing content has been put on the app so immediately there is you know an audience of nearly 60000 students who can look at that so we need to figure out who we can work with also in order for us to reach you know larger wider numbers and different types of uh, populations so i'll i'll end here because we have That's a lot okay. more to say just one more thing i just want to take up uh, take up the virus metaphor as we all know that you know the, the, the transmission is is the is the thing right we are transmitting the virus is you know traveling from one person to another and we have all seen lots and lots of content on that and i was just wondering if one person with a smartphone could be that transmitter we need to look at the creation of new transmitter networks because digital will be a very 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 significant and big 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 avenue for us to reach our audiences but we have to lick the lack of smartphone ownership and access in rural india in order to get there thank you so much radharani i think you've touched upon some critical points um something that we all need to think about the whole issue of the digital divide who has who is able to access information and who is not um highlighting ipr as a workable solution which i think um some of us do dismiss as not being effective but it in fact is a solution um highlighting how we need to strengthen and revive community radio um and i did like both your points on on kind of looking beyond creating communication to creating platforms uh, and your last point of these transmitter networks so um thank you great points um lara i want to shift to you uh, data trust again um in just the past two months has launched a, a massive uh, communication campaign we'd like to hear more about your thoughts on what led you to design the campaign in the way that you did how did you reach those who were most in need um so yes if you could just share some of your experiences and your work uh, with us so sure. thank you so much arundhati for having me here so uh, in as part of data trust most of our most of our intervention works in marginalized uh, rural interiors of the community so we uh, we did a very we did an extensive covid relief campaign uh, recently over a 12 day period and we had a lot of learnings which uh, from that how, uh, with regard to knowledge dissemination and other aspects using the digital mediums because that was the early days of the lockdown and we are trying to now incorporate those learnings into our larger behavior change programs in the wash uh, under the data water mission so i'd like to share just some learnings and some thoughts that i had from that we've developed from this so we i mean behavior change uh, of course interpersonal communication is a very very strong way to work on behavior change but uh, given this uh, situation we'll have to work with a lot of social distancing norms and uh, even though there may be interpersonal communication in rural areas coming ahead once restrictions are slowly slowly lifted we have to use the digital platform and like i'm taking forward the conversation right from where radharani uh, started so um what we've learned is what uh, we learned that whatsapp was a very very uh, effective tool in communities so even though uh, it may not be 100% outreach there is a large population in communities in rural areas who have access to whatsapp whatsapp groups are effectively working frontline workers are all connected at a district block level on whatsapp groups and um, so as in terms of mediums that we tried out and we've got some good success is we tried out different types of video channels which we disseminated through whatsapp and whatsapp groups we particularly tried out what we did was uh, every community has our field teams our community resource people that are working in these regions and you know there's a trust factor involved with the beneficiary and the uh, crp our community field people who are working there 
So we actually got our key messages, which we identified for our COVID relief, and we got our teams to actually make videos on this. So it was a relatable person, somebody that the communities could relate to, they knew of, and these videos were disseminated at large scale. We almost covered 80 lakh people over a 12 day campaign, and we got good uh, results in terms of, we also had a very strong feedback mechanism. So one thing that worked was definitely this uh, recognizable person, a familiar face who was, uh, the videos were passed through. We also looked at identifying regional celebrities at every level, from Santhali celebrities in Jharkhand to, uh, you know, uh, famous doctors in certain regions like in Nandurbar, in Maharashtra, etc. And we looked at their videos and how we uh, disseminated those videos, taking forward the conversation of, you know, transmission network that was happening recently. So we could, through our teams in different states across these uh, 12, 14 states that we worked on, we could develop this transmission network to a large majority of our population. We also developed some animation videos on COVID messages, five of them, which were very, very effective. Other things that we also tried on was, was of, uh, we had an IVR messaging system, but uh, we, our script where we tried to restrict our skip script to around two and a half minutes, our biggest learning there was that 80% uh, of the people, their, their attention span was restricted to around one minute, 20 seconds. So it's important that we now kind of, you know, if we are looking at IVR as a tool, we focus on those earlier, uh, uh, I mean, the first few seconds are very crucial. We also considered, uh, we are now looking at for our larger programs, we're looking at setting up a counseling helpline with a set of FAQs where our teams are trained on ground and how we can actually uh, have this helpline reach out. I mean, people can access this helpline with their questions, et cetera, as and when they want. So some places where WhatsApp videos were not possible, we converted similar videos of two minute scripts and videos and everything was restricted to a two minute regarding, because it also has to be, you know, something that is downloadable at a rural population. So we also did smaller versions of audio messages, which we circulated. Another thing that uh, we're really uh, interested in trying out is we've learned that at least with youth and certain key representatives in the community, Facebook penetration is quite high. So now we are looking at identifying if we can do Facebook live interactions with communities because uh, everybody has access to that. So it's something we are still to pilot, but we are really looking forward to get encouraging results from this. And like I think some of the other panelists uh, rightly mentioned, it was very, what we've learned is it's very important to have a very empathetic messaging. Uh, you know, you are aware of this entire pandemic. So the fears and apprehensions of the people has to come through in what material we develop. So it has to be through a very empathetic uh, perspective. And um, again, there, you know, we have a tendency to recall, I mean, the negative messages tend to stay on higher. So the positive messages have to be further more reinforced to actually uh, overshadow the negative ones. And that's what we have to kind of push in our communication material. And again, the messages have to be very clear. And supposing for hand washing, um, uh, as larger as part of our larger Watson programs, we anyways had a lot of, uh, you know, washing hands and steps of washing hands, etc. It's also crucial to go down to exact behaviors as to exactly when, like five times a day, six times. So which are those five times you have to really engage in, you know, hand washing and things. So we have to break down our messages, not bombard them with too many messages at one time. So it can be. So what we did for our COVID was we developed five messages, which we developed sent on WhatsApp or different mediums over a 10 day uh, period. So every alternate day, every beneficiary was getting one new message. And then that was also followed by a very rigorous feedback uh, collection. So we developed a five, uh, five basic points, which we had a Google form, you know, something very simple in regional languages. And we got the data, then if we, if people were not, not everybody could access that. So then we actually had our field teams calling up individuals to learn what their uh, feedback on those particular behaviors was. And we managed getting very good feedback, which is now helping us understand how we can actually continue with behavior change going ahead. Another thing, like you mentioned, was, you know, reaching out to people who are completely in interiors and there's digital penetration is low. So there, uh, once, like I mentioned, restrictions will slowly be lifted and we will have to continue some sort of IPC in, I mean, interpersonal communication following the social norms and guidelines that are issued by the government. So in that case, we are looking at now equipping our field teams with better tablets, better quality content so that this digital content can be an aid to them 
where they can meet instead of 20 people at a go, they meet four maybe every time, but they have that many more sessions in a day where they use the digital aid, digital tools to uh, reach out to them along with the interpersonal communication, which going ahead would be something we'll have to be looking at, at a, in a restructured way. Um, I think um, another good idea that we're trying to consider is video vans can travel to places where uh, there is no reach of you know other things. So there are these vans which you can design with your digital content and uh, you don't really have to step out of your house to see them. So they go around all over the villages. So that's something we're looking at. Hoardings and wall paintings will also become pretty crucial now to continue reinforcing the messages. And again, it has to has to focus on positive communication. Like, you know, we have to bring in elements of, because fear is overriding now. So how do you, while fear, I mean, fear is there, but you bring in better positive uh, messages, say, you know, aspects of motivations like uh, progressive nurture, you all want your children to do better, or, you know, some of those things. So bring in some concepts of, if you do this, you can maybe be a Samajdar person. That is a campaign that we are using in our communities. And also use some kind of a social and uh, social rewarding structure within that. So that is another thing that I think uh, would be helpful. Another way is, uh, of course, our content has to be available on applications which can actually uh, have data in terms of uh, how many people have been reached out to, etc. And um, so like, yeah, so I think these are some different ways that we have tried and the feedback calls have been very, very effective for us. Uh, one thing that I just want to mention here is see, even if we look at application based uh, mediums, it is, in, it is possible to collect data in terms of how many people have received that knowledge that you are circulating. You can also get data in terms of how many people have the attitude or intent to now practice a desirable behavior. But actually to capture that behavior, we have to build in some kind of protocols or you know, reward mechanisms within our applications, which can actually help. Maybe they put up a, upload a picture after doing a particular thing, they earn some reward points, and then that continues to uh, motivate them to continue doing different things. So these are some learnings that we've had. And of course, we don't have, like I mentioned to you, we don't have many answers as yet, but uh, there is a lot of learning that we have and we are looking forward to continuing engagement and creating sustainable irreversible change because irreversible is the key here because like uh, fear will be there for a while but the positive communication is what has to continue even after thanks lara i think you have um, you've brought to life uh, some of the points that om made some of the points that radha rani made um you've um, i think that your um, now you've talked about how you've used the digital platform as, as one effective way by which to reach communities. I think you made a really important point on IVR messaging and the fact that all of us have limited um, attention spans and how we need to keep our messages short, concise to the point. And also um, this point that Om raised, how do we appeal to people's um, emotions? Uh, and identifying that. Um, I think you've used uh, several innovations, identifying and using local celebrities and putting um, a relatable face onto your messaging, uh, I think has all been really great. Um, and you've touched upon the next issue that we, that we want to raise uh, in this group discussion, which is on how do you track and how do you measure who you reach and how their behaviors may have changed. Um, so we'd like to open this question out to all our panelists because all of you have something to say. Lara, you've touched upon this. So I'm going to ask um, Om to uh, kind of quickly share some thoughts on measuring behavior change in various ways. Uh, so Om, over to you. And if you could just adjust your screen and move a little closer to the mic, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Arundhati. Thank you very much. Um, the measurement of the behavior change is quite critical and quite key. Of course, um, uh, water you know, within the water sanitation and hygiene uh, sector, wash sector, hygiene has always been an add on activity and people think this is a difficult undertaking and, um, and um, always in wash health and um, nutrition sector, it has always been kind of add on uh, activity. And uh, why? Because uh, everybody thinks, oh, this is a complex undertaking. We can't do change. We can't change people's behavior. And politically also, this has never been politicalized in a political domain because you cannot see anything right away. It's behavior change does take time. 
and, and therefore you cannot measure right away. So therefore, I think it has been a kind of you know add-on always. But with the COVID-19, I think we have seen this. We have seen before cholera. Um, uh, sorry, but we have seen before in uh, Ebola outbreaks. We have seen before in cholera outbreaks, and now with COVID, it is evident that. And the without behavior change into the existing programming, either in WAS or in health or in education or nutrition or in WAS and healthcare facilities, the service that we offer is not going to sustain, people is not going to be uh, used. So uh, this is the right time for us to think for a generation to change the behaviors, not for, a right, uh, for, for the moment. So therefore, if we are thinking of changing the behavior for a generation at scale, we should be definitely thinking what sort of things that we are currently using is going to change the behavior, influence the behavior. Here comes the measurement, right? So in the year that you like to talk here. So there are various ways we can measure the behavior. I think in, in traditional um, uh, development programming, we always have four different ways we can measure the behavior. First, we always have used uh, the structure observation behavior, structure observation as a method to send, to observe the behavior, whether people are actually practicing the behavior as a gold standard method. But is it possible now in the COVID-19 scenario at the moment? May not be possible because we need to maintain the physical distancing. You cannot go in individual households to observe and follow the people over time. But this is going to be over for maybe after, uh, maybe few, few months. Of course, we don't know still because we don't have the vaccines, we don't have medicine in place. It might take maybe a year or a year and a half. But as we set up all of our programming, let's never forget that we should uh, measure the, 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 stock, is the behavior that people are actually performing. One is definitely how can we make sure we structurally observe the behavior while people are actually doing or not. The second way of the, you can try and with that with the availability of physical facilities. If let's say if you are looking for investing facilities, whether in the individual households, do they have investing facility with soap and water? If there is no soap and water in the households, even though there is a facility, they may not be um, um, uh, practicing it, right? It's a kind of second way. So we call them is for say going into the individual households, look them whether they have there is a facility or that is a behavioral products people are using it. The second way of doing this. The third way of measuring um, uh, behavior, I'm not saying this is a behavior, it's, it's still going to be a proxy measure. The proxy measure will be asking people whether they have, uh, they understand what are the behavior that links to COVID-19, uh, what are the behavior they should be uh, practicing in, in terms of spreading, uh, reducing the spread of virus, similarly to other disease, is an awareness level of uh, the current level of awareness. But we know the level of awareness is not going to translate into the behavior. So in, and sometimes it's going to be misleading. People might be aware, but they are not practicing the behavior. But it acts as a proxy measure for us to measure the behavior from that way. Since we know that the reported behaviors are not at all compatible or not at all near to how the people practice, so therefore we started measuring a social norms. It's part of the new behavior change uh, science framework. So how do you do the social, measure, uh, social norms measurement is you're not asking yourself whether you are practicing the behavior. We, we are asking question indirectly whether you have seen the, your colleagues, your neighbor, your family members practicing the behavior. So if you ask others behavior, people are likely to give, give you the right answer. But this is again a proxy. It's not going to be gold standard at all. So kind of, you know, it's kind of measurement of the social norms. So, um, so basically, the structure observation of the behavior, the, the sports psych, and, and the, the measurement of social norms and other through the reported behavior. These are some of the, um, the basic um, uh, principles that we have established. But for the COVID-19, let's say we are installing hand washing facilities across different public locations. For what rate, we are currently responding our program in 26 countries across the world. So we're thinking, how can we measure, since we are currently using as first phase of Africa, our campaign basically basically focusing on social media, mass media, digital media, and all of the non-contact methods, including loudspeakers in the village versus the, the radio and the FMs and, and so forth. And also installing a hand washing facilities in key locations. We are, we are developing a framework in such a way that we have the defined target population as we uh, define the delivery channels. Then we aspect the, whether the channel is actually available for the people to enjoy, what time they will use it, what's the rate of proportion the people is going to use it. So under, making that, those estimates at the beginning is quite vital when it comes to measurement. Then subsequently, as we move on, though we cannot go into the household at the moment, in this particular moment, but we can even use some of these digital platforms to even assess whether the people are hearing these messages, whether they liked it, 
what alternative they want, whether there are any social norms. So we can create that platform. So we're actually building some of those questions in Yamwata platforms, and we are currently assessing those. That's, that's the, the, for the first phase of the campaign. Um, similarly, for the second phase of our campaigns, which is subsequently, once the virus is, let's say, content, I'm not sure it's not going to be eradicated at all, uh, for the for, for, for at all, but at, at least it might be eliminated or controlled if we have the vaccines. So what we are thinking for the second phase of our campaign, because we are what we have the ongoing uh, government-led, either national scale or sub-national scale campaigns in few countries. For example, uh, we are supporting a Nepal government um, at the moment as part of the COVID to mass media and so, so forth. But at the same time, we have hygiene integration into routine vaccination program. So that means all over the world, I uh, sorry, all over the country, the mother having a child under one has to go in an immunization clinic to vaccinate the children. At that time when they go, they will attend the hygiene sessions and they will be recorded. I think for that record, uh, the, the measurement framework for that record is how many people attended the clinic um, uh, to vaccinate, how many then attended the sessions, and then following up them with the sur uh, survey subsequently whether they are practicing the behavior. So there are other measurement framework that also we are um, establishing. Yeah. Similarly, for instance, we, have, uh, we are supporting the Clean Green Pakistan in, in Pakistan. So in the previous phase, the subsequent um, phase, we have also measure the, whether people are actually uh, seeing the advert into the television, how frequently they have seen it, and the is categorized in of different age groups, uh, maybe elderly people are frequently, if elderly are quite susceptible for this disease, uh, we should be also focusing on that. And what's the, um, the age range and even gender uh, differences in this. So there are lots of kind of measurement tools that you can bring in. The other part, I think for the sustainability measurement, what we are doing for in Waterweight, we have a mechanism of monitoring the, the post-implementation monitoring survey. We call them PIMS, post-implementation monitoring. We really want to see whether the project itself is sustained over time. So that means we can implement the project now or a media campaign, whatever it is. Then subsequently, we should definitely look what have we learned uh, from these processes. Was it effective for people to uh, change the behavior? That's one. But at the same time, we really need to look what are those or the additional environmental component that actually helps sustaining the project over time. Was the institutional mechanism curated? Was there any coordination mechanism has been established? Was the, is the users committee still functional to, uh, to continuously sustain those behaviors? over time, is there capacity building happening, refresher training happening, materials regularly coming in? We also need to look and measure those aspects. So uh, measuring those aspects and subsequently looking whether the project is still delivering in an educated fashion, we call them post monitoring. Um, so we retrospectively visit the project that implemented over time, last 10 years, and then we go and uh, source those. So we call them post implementation. At this particular moment, may not be feasible, but subsequently in going forward to post COVID era, we should be definitely doing the, the sustainability measurement over time. Thank For you. The, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interject and ask sure, you to hold on sure. from others. Absolutely, but thank absolutely you fine. for raising points on looking at different types of proxy indicators on the whole issue of kind of real time monitoring and measurement, but also this very important point on post implementation, which will give us an idea of whether these behaviors that we're promoting have sustained over time. So thank you for raising these points. Um, Shalini, we'd like to hear from you. What's UNICEF thinking uh, on, um, on uh, measurement? And just before you answer, we have a number of great questions in the chat box. I feel that we may run out of time to actually take those questions live. So those of you who are not speaking um, to our speakers, if you could just look at the chat box, feel free to respond to those who have asked questions um, directly as others are speaking. So Shalini, over to you for your thoughts. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Arundhati. I think uh, Om has uh, covered it uh, very comprehensively, uh, giving a great outline of all the methods uh, that can be used uh, to measure behavior change, which is anyways uh, pretty difficult to uh, measure be it in terms of practices or uh, social norms. We also outlined uh, the various uh, platforms, reach and recall. The one point uh, that I would uh, like to add is understanding the current situation. Even before we start uh, measuring uh, the impact and the, and the practices uh, that uh, people have now started uh, adopting or which have been influenced uh, by uh, the messages uh, which are being uh, promoted. I think it is very critical to understand uh, 
what is what is the context what is the current situation i think with covid it is a evolving and dynamic um, uh, situation all the time and with the digital applications that we have now we do have uh, uh, you know real time uh, data available with us so to to understand uh, this context and then only uh, build our uh, entire uh, social and behavior change uh, framework uh, around with them in the webinar uh, which i was uh, there in the morning id insight uh, presented a very interesting uh, uh, you know research which they have uh, uh, done on um, actually um, uh, what is what is the perception of uh, of people um, uh, about uh, covid one of the point uh, which came up was that the risk perception is very low even though their awareness of uh, you know this huge migrant mobility and the and and the risk of infection is high uh, uh, they they really don't uh, perceive that uh, that there is risk to them and that it will happen to them so uh, i think uh, uh, what is uh, important uh, to uh, really understand is uh, what are the current risk perceptions of people how how are they uh, you know understanding uh, this entire situation another of the another findings uh, which was uh, very interesting was the very low uh, awareness and knowledge about uh, the symptoms of covid i mean to see that uh, the way it is uh, being uh, promoted by government development partners um, uh, cso's uh, it was uh, it was surprising to see that the knowledge levels on uh, covid symptoms was very low especially uh, you know they didn't know anything about um, uh, the sample uh, showed uh, very little knowledge on asymptomatic uh, people so um i think this is uh, one of the things that uh, needs to be uh, really looked into over thanks thanks um, shalini um and uh, i'm so glad that you brought up these uh, new findings by id insight so when you can uh, please do share a link uh, to study findings is that available uh, and thanks for highlighting that um jaipal rani um what are your thoughts on measurement what has what are some of the things that bbc media action has tried if you could just reflect on this rather quickly we have just about 20 yeah. minutes left in our session so i'll request you to be um, a brief so that we can tackle our last question as well thank you let, let me then uh, thanks uh, arunuti let me then focus on measuring online interventions i think uh, other things have been quite adequately covered by both shalini and om um, so when we look at uh, measuring online interventions like social media campaigns as i said it's difficult to measure whatsapp because whatsapp is organic and yes we can track whatsapp groups but remember each whatsapp group has no more than 256 members so that is the limitation of uh, whatsapp and when i say measuring i'm of course talking about measuring at scale so when we look at measuring online interventions the bare minimum is of course looking at matrix so reach and performance which means views engagement engagement rate and uh, what is now increasingly becoming popular and we have at bbc media action uh we uh, we intend using it we have done it extensively in other countries and we have just started using it in india is the use of specialized tools like social listening softwares that can be very helpful in guiding not only content development but tracking so you know tracking everything so basically doing learning changing doing again and all at a fairly uh, you know rapid pace uh then the second thing is conversion so when you are doing something online uh how can we track the call to action that was given to audiences um for example you know through user user gen so are we looking at uh, generating user generated content uh, these are also engagement uh, matrix polls online petitions now in in the context of covid Uh, remember that all of it is also now converting to um online rather than offline so for example earlier say if you were doing a social media campaign and you know getting people to come to a point to either protest or convene or you know do something today uh, we are we are looking at 
inviting people online. So can you give your opinion? Can you do something? So the, the conversion from offline to online, online petitions, etc. And of course, the last thing is impact where uh, if you're looking at an effective social media campaign, are you then being able to demonstrate a tangible impact offline or on ground? So I can we look at more you know, product sold, more tickets bought, uh, more fundraising contributions, more participation in events and activations. Uh, I think post COVID-19, there is a need to think of impactful actions that can be taken online, which is something that I just said. Um, what is very, very critical for making all this happen is, of course, uh, resourcing all of this effectively. So uh, budgets are therefore very crucial, not only for development, but for execution and monitoring. Otherwise, sooner or later, uh, there, there are going to be big questions on, so what was the impact? What was the in engagement? So, you know, it is in the design of a project. How do you design it? Uh, and in it, therefore, all these tracking and measurement mechanisms become inherent and they have to be resourced for. The other point that I wanted to make is that there has to be a kind of, you know, rapid response preparedness. We have to think, we have to be uh, very, very strategic, but we have to do more and we have to do fast. And uh, as an example, at BBC Media Action, in the past seven weeks, we have done an enormous amount of work and a lot of this work is online. So we have done something on, you know, misinformation and fake news that has gone online and that's creating a lot of very good traction. I just mentioned the hand washing film that we have done. It's going live as we speak, but it's already sitting on an app, uh, which is going to be, uh, you know, scaled up. Uh, we are doing, uh, we have done social media outposts, out, outputs, which are going to be spread through networks. So, you know, the, the NFSSM, the National Fecal Sludge, um, uh, the Alliance, uh, we are looking at partnering with ministries, minister, you know, Ministry of um, uh, Housing um, and uh, Urban Affairs are looking at the work we are doing on around fecal sludge, which is also the extension of health and hygiene. So I think that um, in terms of measurement and in terms of putting something out, we really, be, uh, really need to look at uh, two, two critical factors. One is resourcing the rolling out and the tracking and measurement and the other is you know partnering with the right kind of networks uh, whether they're government uh, you know uh, the ministries government channels mass media channels uh, platform owners uh, you know for example like being indian youth ki awaz all of that as well as looking at uh, you know um, uh, looking at other civil society organizations and network so this is my this is what thank i want you. thank you so much adarani um lara any uh, thoughts on this issue from your end uh, before we move on to our last discuss discussion point points have been covered so i wouldn't like to add anything at this point great thanks lara so our last question um, and discussion point is on um for each one of you what is your ask to both government, and this can be government at the national level, at the state level, where several, several of you are engaging. Um, and then for Om, of course, what's, your, what's our larger ask um, uh, globally? Um, so there's one is government, and the other is actually with donors. All of us are increasingly interfacing with donors, getting several um, opportunities to apply for funding. But where do we want to steer their investments? And investment, I know, Radharani, you've repeatedly spoken about this, but others have hinted at this uh, as well. So um, your very quick thoughts on what's our ask to government, what's our ask to donors? Uh, and Lara, if you would like to kickstart this. Uh, sure, Nadi. So I think, uh, I think a lot of stakeholders ac across this entire uh, area have been doing a lot of work and a lot of good quality work with regard to hygiene, messaging, and all other important aspects. And I, what I feel is, you know, uh, this has been the first part of it. But now, as the times are changing, there are other issues like, you know, uh, hunger security or reverse migration and things that are coming up. So it would be important for uh, as, as, uh, as donors or stakeholders or even governments to look at short term as well as mid term, long term, categorize these different solutions with specific objectives 
so that their entire that uh, the cycle of poverty doesn't uh, hit back so i think it's very important to develop short and mid term solutions keeping in mind these changing times because we don't know what's going to be the situation in the next 2 uh, 3 months um, so we have to have all our plan a's and b's and c's in place with regard to that thanks lara um uh shalini any thoughts on since unicef plays such a pivotal role with government what's the ask uh yeah i think uh, one of the first things uh, is uh, the content uh which uh, in which the entitlement information is missing a lot uh i think the government is already uh, providing a lot of entitlements however people who need to receive those entitlements are not aware of it so in the content which is being developed messages which are being uh, promoted uh i think uh, this needs to have a big space and uh, uh, they are very closely uh, related to uh, our hygiene be it um, you know your entitlement on infrastructure or or uh, or for uh, products uh, you need to know about it i think uh, the second point uh, which uh, we are really advocating uh, for uh, with the government and the government is very much on board uh, is the continuity of uh, services uh, i think uh, uh, you know in a time like this uh, uh, where uh, the focus is on the pandemic there are a lot of other issues uh, which are being missed out for example routine immunization so uh, our uh, you know our efforts are def- and this is for all the sectors so our effort is definitely for advocating that uh, you know steps should be uh, taken uh, by the government uh, with all the precautions for the continuity of services uh, for donors of course um, I, they uh, generally you know the the donor community is very stringent on the way uh, we uh, need to work and uh, we need to uh, you know actually provide reports uh but uh, at a t- during humanitarian crisis uh, like this i think uh, uh, what is required is fast and quick action so uh, i think uh, this is this is one thing that really needs to be looked into uh, uh, when um, uh, you know we are uh, doing donor proposals uh, the the traction should be uh, much uh, quicker because i mean if it is delayed too much the time is lost and probably that that uh, you know phase has moved on uh, to the second uh, or the third one so uh, definitely a faster movement uh, would be uh, required over um shalini um uh om uh, your thoughts on ask the government and since you are interfacing with several country governments um are you are you seeing any different ask that we're making what are some of the common ask that we're making to country governments and also since um uh, you're interfacing with potential donor opportunities um what do we want to ask them that we're shifting away from simply the the current crisis to looking at um long term mid term and long term programming as lag like Sure. Thank you, Arundhati. This is a very um, big question, I think, um, um, and big ask as well. So, um, since we interact with many uh, government um, uh, officials and government institutions in in various countries in South Asia, uh, Africa, and Latin American countries, what we are asking for now, I think, a couple of couple of things. One, um, of course, more coordinated uh, response um, with clear country roadmap. this is quite vital now i think in an emergency scenario always happens like everybody would like to jump in that's fair everybody will need to jump in but at the same time we really want to see very much clear road map coordinated road map from the countries to lead in and all partners equally supporting to that road map second one is we have been implemented i think many organizations implemented small scale project this is not the time to implement a small scale project let's think big and act big because we have seen a, a small virus such a chaos globally being a pandemic so we should definitely think i think in a development any development agenda we should be thinking now very big and acting big as a sector 
So thinking big and acting big, we are asking that. So we should be loving for sustained behavior change at this scale per gain. As I said earlier, I think we have been, we, we are fed up with the, with the project implementation modality. This is not the time for us to continue the same mistakes. And as we demand, as we, we work with government to have a sustained behavior change at scale programming, I think it should be also surprising and emotional for the people. We should not forget some of the specific groups that need more attention during all of these um, uh, periods. I think people with disability, um, uh, some of the, the socially discriminated people, we don't want to also kind of exaggerate or stereotype some of the gender norms. I think these things, these issues actually dilutes in any of these crises. So we should be visible and we should be advocating for the government. For the sustained delivery of this behavior change programming, we should be looking what, how can we integrate behavior change programming through the existing government mechanism. I think we all should be equally focusing on this. How can we include behavior change program through health, through education, through nutrition, through private sector? The integration piece is quite vital for us, all of us, to really look, uh, look through. And for the government, I think there are key things, key additional things that I would like to emphasize is how can we politicalize? How can we make that political commitment with better financing from the government? And also the, making sure that we have the right strategy and policy in place. Of course, in many countries, strategies are, are there. The standards are there for water and sanitation. For hygiene, maybe very light. Do they have the right package to implement at national scale? Is, is a question. So those are some of the, 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 um, uh, the ask for the government. I think for the development partners, but they're all development partners. They, uh, I think your emphasis was particularly on the donor. So what we are loving globally is water rate, also kind of you know, encouraging for uh, the different donors. And also uh, since water rate also we represent in different platforms and different networks, we are really demanding for more flexible financing for our behavior change. I think this is the time for us to really think and increase financing for hygiene behavior change over time and um, more focus on evidence generation. So what is working, what is not working, we really, whole sector has to now um, understand this and how can we globally harmonize our effort and where can we collectively put all the resources. Many organizations are rushing to develop new, uh, new products but we should not reinvent the wheel. There are lots of packages that have been developed. One organization developing, other organization can share it so that we can maximize the benefit. So creating that share platform. I think I'm sure many of you in the, in the, in the, in the, in the call might have already heard the Hygiene Hub. The Hygiene Hub initially funded by different uh, Unilever initiatives, now was stated at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So it's a hub where you can actually pose your questions, you can share your learnings and resources. And what result in the steering committee of that. So you can go directly put there. I think I'll put that into the chat. Subsequently, yeah, the link people true. can visit this. Uh, for the global community, I think just, just to sum up, uh, we really need to make resilience uh, was behavior change programming at scale in normal, in new normal. Right? There will be no normal, I think, in, in, in coming years. So we also need to act in a new normal scenario in a harmonized, coordinated uh, efforts um, um, and generating evidence for, I think, for be more effective now and also kind of equipped to, to prevent the future pandemics. Uh, I think those are a few, few ask um, uh, Arundhati, over. Thanks, Thank you. So. Thanks, um, great points. Uh, flexible financing, um, you know, money for evidence generation, political government from government, great uh, points. Um, Radha Rani, um, can I get your quick comments in just two minutes because we do have to wrap up in a maximum five minutes. Um, but just before we get to you, um, for our speakers, please do look at the Q&A box. Please respond because we won't have the time. Unfortunately, uh, my apologies to the attendees uh, for taking this live. So Radha Rani, you just put quick comments in, in two minutes, please. I think we have to rethink most uh, problem definitions in order to come up with answers that will fit in or that will define the new normal. I think that donors have to, particularly in reference to uh, creating communication, donors have to be much more sensitive and uh, uh, cognizant of how communication will be implemented or rolled out to reach its audiences. Because even if you wanted to, you know, we are at the moment creating audio material um, uh, for, you know, extended sort of health and hygiene, but how is it going to go out? So that's a very, very big, big issue. Uh, the third thing, the third thing is partnerships, because as Om just said, how do we align resources and how do we forge partnerships for all of, you know, for, for basically the sum of all of this to be bigger than, you know, the power. And uh, 
we need to create um, create uh, a potent, uh, we need to look at resilience and we need to look at resilience so um, uh, we have heard of schemes and entitlements how do we how do we create a more sort of overarching kind of a thematic area of resilience, which can not just in terms of responding to the problems now, but in going forward, because we have to look beyond also. So these were my four points, rethinking um, problems, um, looking at how resourcing is done by donors, looking at partnerships and looking at, uh, you know, developing the program, a programmatic muscle of resilience. Um, thank you very much, and, and apologies for one rushing all our speakers with uh, with our last discussion point, and also apologies to all our attendees. We haven't been able to answer your questions live, um, but just to recap some of the questions that have come across. Our attendees, our participants have been very interested in the specific materials that organization um, have uh, developed, and I'll just share my screen for some of these the resources, um, I'm sorry, um, that, uh, that our organizations have developed. Um, we also have um, questions that have come up with regards to, uh, to measurement, to reaching particularly vulnerable um, populations, especially in slum contexts, and, and how do you deal with hygiene behaviors in overcrowding situations. Um, here are some links to resources. Uh, as Radharani mentioned, BBC Media Action has a superhero soap film that's available. Um, and uh, UNICEF uh, has supported the Department of Drinking Water and Sanitation for an ODF sustainability advisory on hygiene behaviors. WaterAid, uh, including OM with other colleagues, has written a blog on ensuring uh, how can we support people to wash their hands and to protect people from COVID-19. And uh, there's also a science of hand washing videos, but there are also a whole bunch uh, of other resources um, that uh, you that we hope to share with you uh, at the end of this session. Um, we're going to wrap up now, but thank you to the attendees for being a wonderful audience and for asking great questions. And again, our apologies for not getting to them live, but hopefully um, we have answered them on chat. Uh, we'll also do our best to share um, um, some resources that our various speakers uh, have uh, have highlighted. And a very big thank you to all our speakers, Radha Rani from BBC Media Action, Om Satash Gautam from WaterAid from UK, um, Shalini Prasad from UNICEF India, as well as Lara Golia from Tata Trust. Um, you've shed light on some very important aspects and I think you've gotten all of us to rethink how we're going to be doing hygiene behavior change in terms of messaging, in terms of the platforms that we're going to use, how we're going to measure this, and of course, I think important asks for our governments as well as for our And thank you especially to the Charcha team for their support and to the Water Day team for all the back and support. So with this, I wish you all a very good evening. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.